We will hear now from Ben Levy, an SFU student who also spoke about occupying socialism. I'm a, a master's student at Simon Fraser. I'm studying sociology, and for my master's thesis, I'm doing an ethnography of Occupy Vancouver. And I'm approaching it from a number of sort of theoretical standpoints, one of which is from the standpoint of the uh, economist and political theorist Antonio Gramsci, who was a Marxist writing in the 20s and 30s. Um, and that's sort of what I want to touch upon here. I want to envision the Occupy movement as a form of counter-hegemony, um, largely influenced, if not led by a particular class, but as opposed to the, the manufacturing classes of Gramsci's day, I claim that the class that's most relevant now is that of immaterial laborers, those who are responsible for immaterial production, uh, which, as defined by the theorists Michael Hart and Antonio Negri, means the production of affects and relationships and symbols and knowledges. Uh, not necessarily uh, responsible for the production of, of material products. And that this is going to have a profound effect on uh, Occupy strategy and on the strategy of similar movements. But before I go into Occupy as counter-hegemony, I need to touch upon uh, the existing conditions of, of hegemony. And that is, uh, in the contemporary political economy, I maintain that finance capital, over all other forms of class, has a hegemonic uh, influence over all forms of, of production. So this can be demonstrated in terms of the numbers, the growth in domestic and international investments and financial transfers that have you know, accumulated over the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, but it can also be reflected in the fact that financial institutions, through a process called financialization, have also had a profound effect on organizing non-financial bodies. And in my experience, Simon Fraser University is a perfect example of this. Uh, in every way, the, the current organization uh, and operation of Simon Fraser University is absolutely determined by financial markets and by a, a logic of financialization. So finance capital in the contemporary economy is, is truly hegemonic. Um, and it's become influential in large part uh, as a result of specific technological developments and processes, um, which means that finance capital has gained influence through particular sort of uh, forms of communication infrastructure, which, as I'll argue in a minute, is going to be absolutely essential for conceptualizing the Occupy movement as a class struggle. Uh, and I divide these two forms of communicative, uh, communication infrastructure along the lines written by the sociologist uh, Manuel Castells. He divides it into two different categories. One he calls the space of places, one he calls the space of flows. And the space of flows is that reality, that virtual reality, through which communication is engaged in relatively instantaneously, uh, where distance is uh, almost transcended. Uh, these occur, for instance, through uh, wireless technologies, through internet technologies, et cetera, and through the networks that these various technologies make possible, uh, and without which uh, finance capital wouldn't have be, been able to develop in the method that it has been able to. Uh, similarly, finance capital and international uh, financial processes have been responsible for organizing the space of places, uh, which is basically tantamount to the everyday places in which human beings engage in face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, in this case, most relevantly, within the bounds of the, the city and the urban environment. Uh, cities, and especially major global cities, have been arranged today in such a way that uh, they've attracted those services and been uh, organized along lines conducive to finance capital. Um, so finance capital and its infrastructure has uh, been built up within cities concurrent with legal services, financial services, entertainment services, um, the service sector in general, um, people working in coffee shops, the education sector in terms of teaching and uh, research. All of this is largely developed in order to help the development of finance capital and has occurred largely within the bounds of the city. So these two sort of forms of communicative infrastructure, on the one hand, the tangible infrastructure of the city, and on the other hand, the more virtual infrastructure of ICT networks, uh, websites like Facebook or, or Twitter or wireless communications as with cell phone technologies, have facilitated the rise of finance capital. One of the things that's really interesting is that these same networks are the networks that have been tapped into by Occupy activists in organizing the Occupy movement. They've been very active on, on Facebook, on Twitter, in terms of the space of flows. And in terms of the space of places, the tent city can be conceptualized as a moment of network infrastructure, a sort of microcosm of the larger city itself 
that has allowed activists to come into repetitive or repeated contact with each other on a daily basis, to exchange ideas, to form relationships, and to engage in what I've defined as immaterial labor. So largely by virtue of these networks and this form of communication infrastructure, the Occupy movement has in, invited a very particular class of people, a class of people involved with a particular form of production, namely immaterial production. And it's interesting because uh, at the time that the tent cities were still existing, any stroll through the tent city would reveal a wide variety of people. But most of these people wouldn't have a background in traditional manufacturing um, labor, uh, in blue collar labor, but instead these would be people who have a background with an education, professors or students, uh, people who work in coffee shops, who work in the, the sort of entertainment and service industries responsible for catering to the needs of finance capital, uh, and also the homeless who play an absolutely critical role in providing the functional basis for, for finance capital. We're, we're also very, very present at these Occupy tent sites. So the one thing that's unified this, this great diversity of people is the fact that they're all somehow implicated in these networks of finance capital and in this process of immaterial labor. Um, and it's in that sense that I claim that immaterial labor is absolutely pre uh, prevalent and hegemonic uh, at most of the Occupy sites in terms of this being the class most responsible for the movement's organization, uh, for its operation, um, and for the trajectory that the movement has taken. Um, if we acknowledge that immaterial labor was of paramount importance to the Occupy, uh, the Occupy movement, uh, then in a way we can conceptualize the tent cities, or now that the tent cities are gone, any sort of display of public protest on the part of the Occupy movement, as serving in a way as a form of uh, factory occupation. Not a factory occupation in the classic sense of having a confined factory responsible for manufacturing, as was the case in Gramsci's day, but instead an act of immaterial factory production and occupation, where uh, these are sites in which immaterial production is occurring at uh, an ever-expanding rate. Uh, people are coming into contact with each other within the boundaries of the tent city, are communicating, exchanging ideas, exchanging radical ideas, which goes back to what you were saying, Ingo, I think, in your presentation, when you were talking about the importance of people coming together from different backgrounds and actually exchanging ideas and strategies and conceptions of what a better world could look like. So this is precisely what's occurred within the Occupy movement. So the question is, if immaterial labor is the hegemonic form of labor, what can activists do to use this form of labor as a way to leverage dominant institutions uh, in order to accomplish movement goals? It's a different form of power than was possessed by traditional workers blue collar workers and workers involved in the manufacturing sector. So how can we work with this prominent form of labor within the Occupy movement to accomplish movement goals? The second is that just with the conception of hegemony that Gramsci was talking about, in which the working classes, which he argued at that time were hegemonic, uh, in, in which the working classes uh, had a compulsion or had a need to ally itself with other classes, such as the peasantry, today we need to find tangible, effective, lasting ways in which these immaterial laborers, or those activists most implicated in the Occupy movement, can build up relationships and alliances with, for instance, manufacturing labor. Um, following Gramsci, I think we can also view the Occupy movement as largely being a war of position. That is, a battle not over um, effective control of political institutions, which might be engaged in only uh, through revolutionary efforts, but instead an attempt to, to have an effect over the public mind and to affect the, the public ideology and the public common sense, the ways and the values through which people view their everyday world. And I think the Occupy movement has come a long way to accomplish this. Uh, concepts such as the 99% or the term Occupy have become very prominent recently in, even in institutional media, but certainly in the public mind. But it hasn't gone far enough, and I'd argue that it's precisely because it's failed in accomplishing this war position, this war of ideology, that it wasn't able to cultivate the popular support necessary for the movement to ward off police violence, which eventually exerted itself in terms of deconstructing the tent cities. Um, I guess that's everything I'll mention for now. But again, all of these strategies are supposed to uh, be portrayed as questions that we can sort of uh, address in, in analyzing how these insights can actually have a strategic uh, effect on movements such as Occupy in the future. So, thank you. 
I will continue to invite you to participate on the building of a new political system. You can visit nowpolling.ca and when you're ready to participate, you can register your opinion, your initiative. Perpetual Direct Democracy is a booklet published by Amazon.com and you can also read it online at pacific.ca. Best wishes on this holiday season and Happy New Year. I am Pedro Mora.